Hello, my name is Mystery, and we are going to be looking at the Australian Federal Government's proposed legislation on controlling misinformation and disinformation. We are well in to the information age right now, and there is a massive battle going on on the world stage right now between old media and the establishment and new media, i.e. social media. And that is exactly what any attempt to talk about and categorize things as misinformation or disinformation or malinformation. All of these new buzzwords and topics are coming up as part of an effort to control the truth. I know that sounds really dramatic, but it really is that crazy. Like we've seen in the past, there have been ideological wars on many things that the West has claimed. So, you know, first we had the war on communism, so the Red Scare, then there was the war on drugs, so a fight over our very consciousness, which had in the background of it though, controls over certain territorial disputes. And then you had the war on terrorism. Again, another ideological battle, but really it was about, you know, the global ruling class and the economic elites trying to figure out, you know, how to disrupt the Arab nations in a way that would be beneficial to oil trade and production. And now here we are in the 21st century, like I said, in the information age. And now we have a war on the truth. And this misinformation bill is just about that. The government and governments around the world are deciding that because people are too unruly when they start spreading their own ideas on social media, it's time to rule it in and tell people what's the truth and what isn't. So we're going to get into specifically what's happening here on the world stage and why this is really, really very scary stuff because like we are standing, like I said, on the cliff, looking out over a great battlefield, a great war that's going to be waged for many a year. And this is part of the tools of that form of warfare. So we are going to look specifically at the legislation. I've seen a number of commentators talk about this already, but no one's really gone into the specifics of the legislation and the supporting documents that come with it. So we're going to go through that in a lot of detail. So strap yourself in. There's nothing like looking at legislation. It's riveting stuff. And like, I'm not sure why everybody doesn't want to make a career out of doing it. So enjoyable. Uh, but yeah, we're going to look at that. We're going to look at the legislation. And then we need to break down kind of what ramifications this has for, you know, Western society at large. The idea of a liberalized democratic nation, because that's the way they are framing this. Okay, this whole debate about misinformation, that whole thing kind of will boil down to what's happening in a strategic sense on the global stage. So we will we will get on to that. But we first we're going to start with what the Australian government has been talking about. So so just to get rid of any um, kind of miscommunications that might be out there um, about this topic, it's a piece of legislation that is an amendment to communications legislation that exists already. And this specific amendment says it all. Combating misinformation and disinformation. This is a battlefield right now. This is about fighting the spread of a disease, people. And the disease is your mind. There is a disease on your mind at the moment. And so it's very telling how they have worded that subconsciously. It's just come right through. You can really tell a lot from legislation by the way that these people have crafted things. Now, what are they saying that this legislation is? Like, what the hell is this legislation? Anyway, it is to impose obligations on digital community uh, communications platforms providers. So that actually means the social media companies. OK, in relation to the dissemination of content on a digital communications platform that contains information that is reasonably verifiable as false, misleading or deceptive and is reasonably 
likely to cause or contribute to serious harm of a specified type. Okay, so social media company spreads information that can reasonably, reasonably, that's what the lawyers love. They love those terms. Like, you know, you fight over the word reasonable uh, forever and a day. Reasonably verifiable as false misleading. So like, you know, there's evidence to suggest that it's it's wrong what is being spread and it's going to cause harm. So those are your qualifiers. But what is this legislation anyway? Like what is actually happening with this bill? What are they actually proposing here? And to, for that, we're going to go to the actual legislation itself. I think it's really important um, to actually go to the source. So this is what legislation looks like. If you've never come across it, like I said before, um, it can be a very, very exciting read. I suggest that you go through it. I have. I've spent a lot of time going through the legislation now and reading it for myself and trying to figure out what it is that they're really trying to kind of establish uh, with the legislation itself. But the intention here with this misinformation bill is to get social media platforms to regulate themselves. It is not about the government coming in with legislation to actually go after particular content creators or people that might put up social media posts that could potentially be misinformation or disinformation. What this legislation is all about is all being targeted at the social media platforms themselves and it wants them to set up practices and processes for capturing misinformation and disinformation and dealing with misinformation and disinformation. And it also has in there in the legislation that if they don't deal with it and follow the processes that they can be penalized and that results in you know legal action and some pretty severe fines for the social media providers now the kind of the the glue that ties all of this together is that there is a state oversight of this. It's not just like, oh, here's some legislation. And so like, we, let's just make sure that the social media providers out there follow the legislation and put in these processes and practices. No, no, it's not that simple. Let me just turn over to um, the page here for you. What the juicy part about this is, is the, the the body or the authority of the government that's looking into this. If you haven't heard of this potentially nefarious organization, I'm going to demonstrate that it, it will be used nefariously, but like we'll get to that. The ACMA, the Australian Communications and Media Authority, they are riddled throughout the legislation as needing to be there to oversee the social media platforms, processes, uh, in order to responding to misinformation and disinformation. Basically, what I'm saying is the ACMA, as the government's authority and, and department that's going to basically overlook what the social media companies are doing and will approve the processes that they have for dealing with misinformation and disinformation. So the government isn't taking a back seat and just writing legislation and, and, and hoping that social media companies will do the right thing and regulate themselves. No, they're in there and they get to approve what is misinformation and disinformation. So the government will be helping to decide what misinformation and disinformation is, but they're holding it at arm's length and they won't be cutting stuff out themselves. They'll be expecting the social media platforms to cut the stuff out. And if they don't, they will be fined. And that's how this legislation works. That is how it is structured. It is structured in a very crafty way, like I said, to make it seem like the government's not involved at all, but they're definitely in the process behind the scenes, backstage, making it all happen. Now, if you've ever wanted to know how to read legislation, I, Mystery, will, you know, will happily teach you how to do this. But like, 
the most important thing that I think comes in legislation is the objects of that legislation, which is really important. Okay. So you have at the start of a body of legislation, you, before you, you have your table of contents and what's going to be in it and stuff like that. But then you should have, you know, the important definitions so you can refer to what the hell they're talking about in the legislation. Then you have something called the objects of the legislation, and then you get into all the provisions. So all of the rules, all the, the, uh, the things that are specified in that piece of legislation. But let's just say you get to those provisions, those specific parts of the legislation, and it's kind of a gray area. It's not too clear what it is actually saying, which this legislation is absolutely riddled with we'll get to that, you can actually go to the objects and the objects are supposed to be there to kind of tell you, well, like when we were drafting this, this is what we had in mind. This is what we were trying to do. So all of those provisions should relate somehow back to the objects of the act itself. This is what we were trying to achieve. And so like when the lawyers want to fight over this, you know, and like bleed people dry, they can refer to the objects too and say, well, what were they intending? to do with these provisions and clauses. So I, look, you can read them all for yourself. They're absolutely full of nothing, but this was the main one for me and it's A, okay? And I've highlighted it here for you. It's the object of this legislation, this misinformation and disinformation combating it is to enable end users, so people that use social media and contribute to it, to better understand the accuracy and credibility of content disseminated by uh, using digital communications platforms, so social media, particularly content that purports to be factual or authoritative. So it's trying to help people understand the accuracy and credibility of content disseminated using digital using social media. Now, if that was true, like honestly, if that was true, then it wouldn't be about removing content. It wouldn't be about that because this is effectively what is being done here. And this is what everyone is complaining about. By extension, by claiming that something is misinformation and having to have a process in place to bring that down, if it can cause people harm, you are censoring. That is censorship, cutting information out of the public sphere so it cannot be considered by people is censorship. This is what evil dictatorships do. They do it all the time because they don't want people attacking or calling into question the status quo. And here in the Western world and in liberalized democratic societies, so free countries, censorship is supposed to be a bad thing and it's bad not just because, you know, it's it's not right to cut people out kind of thing. It's not right or it's it's bad because it is not conducive. It does not produce an informed citizenry. Okay? We need to be informed. We need to be exposed to multiple points of view in order to be better participants in the democratic process, to be politically informed and make good decisions. We need to be exposed to crap, okay? That's just part of what it's like being an adult. You have to discern between what is right and what is wrong for you and then make decisions based on that. So the idea, like, let's look at this. End users to better understand the accuracy and credibility of content. How do people understand accuracy and credibility of content better if you just cut content out? Just think about that for a second. If that is the object of this act and what it will result in is censorship, it does not help people better and more accurately understand information that is being disseminated. It just gets rid of it. And that is a really important, I think, very, very important distinction to, to make and a claim and an assertion to grapple with when we go through all of this in more detail. Now, in support of legislation, there is usually documentations that go with it. There's, there's something called, it's like basically an ex explanatory explanatory memorandum 
Okay, and so this is a report basically that goes with the legislation to help explain what it is and why it's come to this point. And like, you know, it's given out to people in parliament to kind of help them understand it, but it's available to the public. So it's available to us to help, um, you know, get in the minds of the people as to why they are doing this legislation in the first place. And so let's go down to where they kind of give us I don't know, they're explanations as to why like this legislation is necessary and like i said it's all about like kind of purporting to protect people okay against harm harm that can be caused by people getting on social media and spreading nonsense and then people reacting to it and doing stupid things but like let's just go down to this is an important part here so in democratic countries such as Australia, which rely on the free flow of information to inform public debate, the integrity, diversity, and reliability of information is fundamental to our democratic way of life. All right. So I want to draw attention to the fact that Australia and democratic countries rely on the free flow of information to inform public debate. That is the most important part of that, sen that sentence is it is the free flow. But this legislation, the intent of this legislation, right? And we've talked about already is to actually stop the free flow of information facilitated by social media. Social media in this information age is the tool of people that gives them almost a liberal and a democratized level of information transfer of opinions from one person to the other instantaneously from this part of the globe to like the opposite end of the earth. And this is where government control is going crazy. What is effectively being said here is that you, okay, are not smart enough to think for yourself. And so we, the government, are going to take it upon ourselves to discern what is safe information for you to digest. If they truly cared, if they truly cared about the longevity of democratic culture, they would simply ensure that government keeps up with their own educational programs to combat what it sees as harmful. You know, like propaganda campaigns, ad campaigns, like you go on your social media and you see ad campaigns from the government anyway. They can do their own propaganda campaigns. It should not be about constraining the free flow of information. People need to see crap, as I said before, to, to, to decide for themselves whether to believe it or not. Like just watch, watch Sky News, for example. Okay, it's not news. It is just propaganda. And if you've watched it, if you've ever watched it before, if you do watch it, you have to choose whether or not you think it's acceptable or not. You get to make that decision as an adult, as a member of a democratic society. So like, this is really important. If they were really upset about the spread of misinformation, and disinformation, they would be controlling it across the board. And that's why I think this is a very important, like the Sky News example is very important because let's see what it is or who it is this applies to. And this is in the legislation itself, this part, you can actually go and see uh, what they've decided as, you know, being affected by the misinformation legislation or not, but it does not apply to any professional news association. So remember the ACMA that I talked about before, that organization gives out media licenses and they control media through other means. They have other codes and practices and things like that. So any professional news outlet is completely, um, is completely absolved from being affected by this legislation. And, and it attempts to make sure that anything that is regarded as reasonably, remember there's that word that lawyers will fight over to death, reasonably regarded as parody or satire or reasonable dissemination of content by any academic, artistic, scientific or religious purpose. So these types of things 
are excluded from what is potentially misinformation. And this kind of gets more to the heart of what the hell is misinformation? Because the big question mark in, in, in my mind, uh, I don't know about you, but like from reading all of this information that they put out, the legislation, the supporting documentation that goes with it, there's no one that has actually defined what misinformation actually is. Like the, the legislation itself defines what qualifies as misinformation, what can be misinformation. Like I said before, it's something that could be verifiably be false and could lead to harm. But what is the misinformation? Like what is the things that they find to be actually false and actually leading to harm? That is the million dollar question. No one's actually defined specifically what misinformation is. It's just what it could be. Things that do this. But what is that thing exactly? And they leave it very open because, well, I don't think they want to make a call on it themselves. They want to leave that up to the social media platforms to make that decision. So another question that really comes to mind at this point is like, why is the government doing this in the first place? Like, honestly, like what is the actual point of this legislation? And that is a very interesting question. And for someone like me, who, if you're familiar with my content, everything flows back, all roads lead to Rome, and that is capitalism, baby. It's all got to do with that. And part of that kind of capitalist framework for the way the world works is that there is a form of imperialism that is definitely happening on the world stage at the moment. And America is massively part. It, it is an imperialist machine. It is superpower number one, as people like to call it. And the Americans are doing this at home at the moment. So the Americans have comparable. Well, no, not even comparable. Um, their version of the ACMA it's not a very similar organization, but they have the power to regulate, is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. So it's the CISA. And yet it's as hardcore as it sounds. Its job is to delineate what is misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. So types of information that could cause a threat to public security or public harm, especially digital and cybersecurity issues and things that anything basically that the government decides as is false um, and is yeah, misleading to the public. It works hand in hand with the social media companies to take down that information um, and decide, I guess, yeah, what is important for people to see and what is important for people not to see, i.e. censorship. So the US has been doing this. If you've ever heard of RFK talking about it in his presidential candidate race, he is, a, he, he is massively concerned with this stuff as an old Democrat himself. Um, and then now someone who's, uh, you know, supported Donald Trump. He is like so far kind of in the middle of the road with this one. It's really hard to place him. But one of his biggest concerns here is this whole battle over information or you know really behind the information like we've said before this battle over the truth and what people <coughs> what people should be digesting as true or not and so australia as we know thanks to its strategic partnership with the us it it heeds its master's goal come here boy every time the americans do something like this the australians are right there eating out of the Americans' hands and making sure that they're doing the same thing. Because at a global level, you need a coordinated approach from all governments in order to pass similar legislation. So if you're trying to control information in a certain way, then you need to do it across your entire kind of strategic partnership, your ally group, to make sure that these, you know, corporations that are helping spread information are all held to the same account across the board, across every individual national government. So there's no holes that they can escape through or things that can, you know, get past the keeper and through to the net. They don't want any, any leaks. And so they need a, a very tight, coordinated approach. And that's why I believe the Australian government is doing this. It's doing, it's following 
what the Americans are doing now. So I think this is apolitical, to be honest, uh, from an, uh, an Australian perspective. Any government that would be in right now would be doing this wholeheartedly. The coalition, the Labor government, if we had a third party that was, you know, that had took power, any one of those governments would be doing this in order to uh, follow the call of our American leaders. Now, there is another reason for this in terms of the global establishment and the um, economic elites out there, but we will we will get to that um, eventually. But like, let's have a look at some important parts. Like we've talked about kind of how the legislation is going to work or how the misinformation is going to be controlled. They're going to leave it up to social media platforms, but they're going to approve what they can and can't do, but then they'll let them do all the censoring. But like, as I said right at the start, this is an attack on our freedom of expression. This is an attack on our human rights and specifically our political rights in free countries and like, you know, in a free, in a free world. And so we're going to have a look at what the government actually has to say about that because they've considered this already for themselves. They are fully understanding of the contradiction here that if you're going to do what they're proposing to do, which is conceivable as censorship, you are undermining our human rights and our political rights in this country. And so we're going to have a look at what it is they've said about this. So this is some warped mental gymnastics, but you have to understand where they're coming from. If you're going to do something authoritarian, right, which is what this is, if you're going to come in and tell free people in a free society what they can and can't think, at, you are exercising your authority and you're telling them that they're not able to think for themselves. You have to justify it some way. And they're actually doing it like, you know, like I'm sure they think it's clever. It's not that qu clever. It's rather manipulative, but they're doing it by saying that they need to attack freedom of expression to uphold other freedoms. And so you can see these four dot points here. Okay. So there's the right to the security of the person dot point number one. There is dot point number three, the right to be protected against discrimination and dot point number four, the right to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. Okay. So as we talked about before, there are circumstances where misinformation on social media could lead to the harm of persons or a group of people. Well, if that happens, then the government is failing on their obligations to meet the right of the security of the person, the right to be protected against discrimination and the right of um, the highest attainable physical and mental health. And so they are saying that it is essential to do away with freedom of expression to protect those rights. They are giving a hierarchy of rights here and they're deciding that it is okay in this case to get rid of freedom of expression to to protect these things the second dot point there which is interesting we haven't talked about this yet is the right to participate in public affairs and to vote and to be elected at a genuine pre um, periodic elections so this is about how misinformation could be potentially harmful to the democratic process itself so elections um we'll speak about that soon but like that's what again that's another one that they've cited as why we need to do away with this you know, annoying freedom of expression anyway, it's, it's to protect the democracy itself. Now, they are acknowledging here that there are two rights that are going to be limited by this. And those two rights are in those dot points right there. So the right to privacy and the right to freedom of expression. Now, before we go into each one of those in detail, um, the ones that are being violated, that is. Let's have a look at what they define, what they specifically define misinformation or disinformation as. I think it's incredibly important at this point. So the meaning of misinformation and disinformation for the purpose of this schedule. So the purpose of the legislation, dissemination of content using a social media provider is misinformation on the digital service if the content contains verifiably false, misleading or deceptive information. So we talked about that one. It is content provided on this on the platform to one or more end users in Australia. So it actually has to go to someone in Australia. The provision of content on the platform 
it is likely to cause or contribute to serious harm and it's not excluded dissemination so remember we talked about there's certain things that are excluded from this like you know professional news outlets and certain types of content like things that might be a parody or a satire or academic or scientific though you know again lawyers will argue that for that over days what is reasonable okay and so disinformation is pretty much the exact same thing i don't actually understand what the difference is they have the exact same definitions pretty much and so those are those are the qualifiers for what misinformation is remember like i said before this doesn't tell you what misinformation is so like if misinformation was um you know telling people to wear a hat and you know full length clothing instead of wearing sunscreen then like we wouldn't know from reading that like if it ends up to, you know causing harm some way then like we wouldn't know that until after the fact so i don't know how you're supposed to actually tell what misinformation is here um from this definition it is what this definition does it tells you what qualifies potentially as and some misinformation and that is a massive distinction that is a really important distinction to make in understanding all of this but the word that they brought up in there was the word of harm okay which i think is very interesting because not only does it have to be you know unverifiable here's the here's a really important thing and it has to be this and it has to be that it has to cause serious harm as well Sorry, does it say it has to or is it possible? Cause or contribute. Okay, so it does have to actually do, end up doing something. So here is serious harm. Harm to the operation or integrity of a commonwealth, state, territory or local government electoral or referendum process. It's interesting. Harm to public health. Hmm, I wonder what that's about. You know, pandemic, okay? Vilification of a group in society, discrimination. D, intentionally inflicted physical injury to an individual in Australia. So like if you get on social media and start calling for violence against someone. The imminent damage to critical infrastructure, disruption of emergency services, imminent harm to the Australian economy. Look at that one, F. Check that one out. Figure out that bad boy. Huh? That's interesting, isn't it? The banking system or financial markets. And this has significant or far reaching consequences for an Australian community or a segment of the community or an individual. So basically, if it can cause harm to anyone, but I think the important qualifiers here outside of anyone, because we looked at the rights they're trying to protect, right? It's they're trying to protect, you know, individuals and groups of individuals um, and maintain their health and the electoral process. But then you've got the Australian economy in there and like emergency services and critical infrastructure. They just threw that one in just in case anyone decides to, you know, boycott critical infrastructure somehow. So like these things, these matters of harm um, are very, very wide ranging. And for someone like me, okay, this is a, a very selfish piece of content. I am worried about this stuff because I am a revolutionary by definition and anti-capitalist. And so like I am constantly going on about how the how capitalism sucks and like the Australian economy is part of the capitalist world order and so for me to talk against the australian economy and like let's say i advocated for a strike or something like that and there was a strike that actually went down and i somehow contributed to that i could be misinformation in the eye in the eyes that i have caused harm to the australian economy like look this is real stuff like look is what is happening in america right now with the port strikes now they have shut down the american economy on the east coast effectively from a production distribution standpoint because it is their right to to strike they want better pay and they want certain conditions but like if you're advocating for that and that causes harm to the australian economy somehow you can be taken down for misinformation get a few strikes against your name and you're gone that's how this type of stuff works as censorship 
But like now we've got a grasp of what they're defining it. Let's go back and see how they've justified the nefarious stuff that they're doing. So we're going to go down and just briefly speak about privacy because I really want to get onto like what it is that is an attack to freedom of expression the because that's my main concern although the privacy thing is very important too so basically when we started liberal kind of societies um, a few hundred years ago there was kind of this right to privacy enshrined in the ideals of free market ideologies let me just add and that was about not being you know tracked by the government and being watched by the government and so privacy really revolves around this idea of being able to move in a space like the public domain and not being watched and controlled in that way and so there is a there's a problem with privacy here because as part of the legislation requests, you have to have these, like as a social media uh, platform, you have to have these practices and processes in place for managing misinformation. And one of those is when misinformation occurs or complaints about it occurs, you have to gather information about the people that are doing it or the people that are complaining. You have to gather that information, keep that information, report that information and give it back to the government. And so they are forcing social media platforms to violate this this basic political and human right and say, yeah, keep records on people, watch them, collect information on them and give it back to us and tell them what they're, tell us what they're doing. So this is a massive violation of the right to privacy, which no one has talked about yet. I haven't heard any politicians talk about this. I haven't heard any other commentators on um, social media speaking about this, but this is a massive factor here. Um, but like, you know, obviously it's less important in an information age because everyone just gives up their information all the time, their data all the time, but it's still important because the government is expressly saying, up yours privacy laws social media companies collect this information and give it to us we want to know who these people are now for this to be legitimate okay for you to violate privacy the un has said that it must be imposed so you can read that here in pursuit of a legitimate objective and must be necessary and proportionate to the achievement of that objective and lo and behold yes they have said that they are doing this they they have justifications in here but basically they say well to uphold people's safety the safety of the individual and the communities we must do this it is necessary for us to do this okay so that's how they've grappled with that one now freedom of expression Here's the big one for me and the one that you hear people talking about and arguing about why this legislation is so wrong so it is one of the articles of the International International Covenant on Political Rights, Civil and Political Rights, that freedom of ex expression should be maintained and not violated. Now, let's go down to that article number 19. I spent a bit of time considering articles now. I never really thought I'd have to do this until living in a society that was getting increasingly authoritative in its responses to things. But here's article 19, uh, sub clause two. Everyone shall have the right to freedom of expression. This is, so this right shall inc include freedom to seek, receive and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, either orally writing or in print how outdated um in the form of art or through any other media of choice okay so that includes social media obviously now the important thing to remember here though and like they 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 understood this okay the old un they understood this that there are restrictions to this so number three okay in exercising these rights you can't basically you can't offend any of the other rights. So look at 3A there. So for the respect of the rights and reputation, reputations of others. So like I said before, you can't freely express yourself if you're asking people to go and kill someone else. That's obviously a violation of their rights, the security of the person, their own health and safety. 
Um, look at 3B, for the protection of national security and public order, so including public health and morals. There is already inbuilt into the definition of what freedom of expression is, there's a qualifier here, but it can't be this, national security, public order, public health, everything's aligning here, so we can see how they're using, they're going to be justifying this. But like, I want to point out, and I think really importantly, what the UN has kind of, you know, after dealing with this for such a long time, decades, these political rights and civil rights, it's extended or it's kind of qualified its position on things. Freedom of expression includes the right to seek, receive and impart information that may be deeply offensive and the right to seek, receive and impart information irrespective of the truth or falsehood of the content whoa 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 it is part of freedom of expression itself to actually lie or do things in a falsifiable way well 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 that is part of freedom of expression like think of parody and satire which they have protected here protected like you know sometimes you definitely say things that are false or untrue because it's funny but at the at the end of the day you're trying to prove a point about something sometimes you have to say things that are false in order to express yourself properly and so this misinformation is directly this misinformation legislation sorry is directly an affront to freedom of expression because it needs to be there it's fundamental to what it is okay it's really really important now the the people that wrote this report and came up with this legislation give us another very interesting concession here that we must think about so these measures the legislation could feasibly incentivize digital communication platform providers, social media platforms, to take an overly cautious approach to the regulation of content that could be regarded as misinformation and disinformation. Or, in other words, they could have a chilling effect. Thus, these measures could burden freedom of expression. Here we go, okay? The government isn't going in there and saying, this is exactly misinformation, so you are as a content creator. Um, uh, creator you're fired you're off you're censored you you're censored no 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 no. they're gonna let the social media platforms do it by approving what they can constitute as misinformation and so if you're a social media provider right and like you don't want to have to go through all these legal processes with the australian government you don't want to be fined and the fines can be pretty enormous, actually, if you look at the way the legislation is um, structured. But like, if you don't want to be fined, what do you think you're going to be doing? You're going to be taking an overly cautious approach to self-regulation. You're going to just be like, well, this could be misinformation. This could be disinformation. And we've looked at the definitions. It's pretty open. It doesn't actually tell you what it is. It's just what it could be. It could be something that's harmful. It could be something that does this. And so they're just going to be like, you know what? You're taken down. You're taken down. You're restricted. You're censored. Because they don't want to have to deal with it. They call it here the chilling effect. Eh? Eh? We were talking about how this legislation is going to be nefarious. Well, here it is. It's going to have a chilling effect. And that's a two-way street. That's just not chilling for the social media platform. That's chilling for the content creators. So if you like your content creators, your favorite content creators out there, and you're worried about them being curbed, well, this will have a chilling effect on them too. They're going to be thinking in the back of their mind before they go and make a piece of content, ooh, should I be doing that or not? No, I don't think I should be doing that. What if I get a strike against my name? What if I'm controlled by this? What if I'm cut out of the platform altogether? I better not do this. I don't want to lose everything just because I might be considered misinformation or disinformation, which we have no idea what it is anyway. But the UN has this covered too. Okay, they've thought about this. They're saying, look, if there is a case where for some reason, for you know, protection of individuals or protection of public order, you need to create a rule that infringes upon freedom of expression, then it needs to follow this three-part test. 
okay, to determine whether it's a valid claim against um, attacking freedom of expression. And number one is all we need to look at. We don't need to go any further with this one. It must be provided by the law. This may be in formal legislation or an enactment or of statute. So law again, basically. So it must be formal legislation and it must be formulated with sufficient precision to enable an individual to regulate his or her conduct accordingly. It's right there. You can see it. And here is where it all falls down. The government has to provide clearly, so sufficient precision in law, what constitutes misinformation or disinformation. They simply say it's defined in the schedule. Look down here. Let me just scroll down so you can see it properly. This first test is satisfied because the measures set out in Schedule 9, so the legislation, are either prescribed in the legislation or will be prescribed in digital platforms and rules, approved misinformation codes or misinformation standards. Wrong. Okay. It says it's defined in the schedule, which it's not. We've looked at it. It says what qualifies it is something that might do harm, something that might cause problems in this sense or be verifiably false. It might do that. But what is the misinformation itself? What is it that people shouldn't be doing? Well, and then they pass the buck onto the social media platforms to come up with the codes and the standards that the ACMA approves. This is not law. So this whole piece of legislation falls over because it doesn't meet test number one in terms of violating freedom of expression. If you want to violate freedom of expression, you must do it in law and be very precise about what that misinformation is. They are not precise at all in their legislation. And like they are constantly in this document. You should read it for yourself providing examples of where these types of things have been violated in the past and why it's so important for us to do it. Like, and it's important for us to have the examples that they're keeping in mind here. So right to the security of the person. Let's have a look at that one specifically. Okay. They have talked about here with right of the security of the person, the situation that happened in the UK earlier this year. So there was a incident where three young women were stabbed by someone who was claimed to have been a migrant on social media. And it ended up that they weren't a migrant at all. They were like born in the country or something like that. Um, but like, you know, they went on a massive race riot, race fueled riots uh, in the UK and they destroyed a lot of property and you know just went absolutely nuts. And that was apparently started because someone said on social media that they were a migrant. And so they were like, oh, we've got to secure the right of the individual, up yours to freedom of expression. In the Bondi Junction knife attacks, a similar thing happened. Apparently someone was pinned as being the perpetrator and the person did all the stabbing, ended up not being that person. And that person ended up receiving death threats and all these bad things happened to them. Um, in terms of the electoral process, they um, are using examples like what happened with Donald Trump in the last uh, election between him and Biden. Um, Trump said that the, the election was rigged. And like there were a lot of news organizations, like professional organizations that were out there sp um, spouting that story too, that the election process was rigged. And like there was no, uh, and, and so like they're saying, oh, social media was the cause of all of that or is a big factor in all of that. So we need to curb misinformation. So they're deciding that people can't talk about these issues. Now, like, I think that is an attack on free speech as well, because like in the American sense, free speech is where you are able to say anything you want about the government and the state and not be held accountable for that. Because for the longest time throughout human history, we kind of lived in societies that were despotic and autocratic. So we basically lived under kings. And like, you know, if you said something wrong about the political establishment or the king or the state, like you could be killed or thrown in jail for the rest of your life. And so like their freedom of speech is a big one, but like they're even curbing like that idea here. Oh, well, you can't speak about the electoral process. 
No? Like, what if you actually thought it was rigged? What if you, you know, had a, an opinion on that? Like, you should be able to voice that opinion. If people think it's not safe, well, then you're going to have to do a lot of speaking and talking about the topic it's yourself. Get on social media and do your own job. What well, the problem here is that people are lazy. If someone says something they don't like, they want to just complain about it, spread it as misinformation so they can move on. Well, like, if you don't like to hear something in the marketplace of ideas and you think that someone is wrong and they shouldn't be allowed to say that, well, then you get up and you start talking too. If you're not going to fight them, yourselves that is a problem and that's what democracy is all about being in a democratic system means you have to participate you can't just say well like the government should regulate it or something like that no that's a dangerous precedent and we can see what happens when the government wants to regulate stuff they are only censoring things that they think are an attack on them not an attack on people they don't give a shit about protecting the right of the person. Like you saw in there, they have the Australian community. What an amorphous topic that is. Like, how do you actually define what the Australian community is? Is there anything that could affect the Australian community? Like our, our values, whoever determines that. The Australian economy, the electoral process, emergency services and critical infrastructure that was just sneaked in as part of the harm. What the hell has infrastructure and critical services of the economy got to do with any of these rights? Uh, and like, because this is the justification you're seeing here. These four dot points are the justification for this whole thing. Freedom of expression doesn't matter because it's about people, but they've thrown in all of these important things about maintaining the government that can't be attacked or can't be talked about and will be censored because it could cause harm to governmental processes and the state. This is what's really going on here with this legislation. It's a wedge to get in ways to control the populace and I will get on to exactly why. Now, Let's have a look at this really, and this is why it's really important to read these kinds of things. Cause like every now and again, they kind of put in this little gem, this little gem that tells you the whole story in like, you know, 10 words or something like that. Now I posited to you earlier that it wasn't just because we were calling to the, um, to our, to our masters, um, the U S and like they've, they're creating legislation around this. So we should be doing this too. This is also this war on the truth is a problem for the global establishment. Our economic overlords, the people that control the global financial system, the multinational transnational corporations, the billionaires club, they are worried about information. Like I said before, information used to be controlled pretty well. So like if you've ever read Manufacturing Consent by Chomsky, like you would have a good understanding of how the world used to operate when there was mainstream media that controlled the entire conversation. There was something called the Overton window. So there was a specific part of conversation that you could talk to talk about, like, you know, on both extremes, the left and the right, if you want to call it that. But there were things outside of that you just couldn't even get in the conversation at all. So it was controlled pretty well. And you had the kind of the economic elites kind of controlling that process and working with the people that controlled all of the media to control the global conversation. And when you control the global conversation, you control global politics pretty well, very well. But in a social media age, and that's what, let's just not forget the, the prefix in that, that word, that amalgamation of words at least, is social. In social media world, people create their own media and the social media platforms just are a place of distribution of that. So like it can, can be curbed by the distributor, don't get me wrong, but the people that are doing the media creation are people, real people everyday people like you and me. It's not formal news organizations, like I said, that can be controlled by a, a, an elite group of people with their own political interests. And so here's what the World Economic Forum have to say about the biggest threats to humanity in the 21st century, not nuclear war or World War Three, but this, the World Economic Forum's 2024 Global Risk Report warns that misinformation and disinformation 
may radically disrupt electoral processes in several economies over the next two years. Guess who's having an election very soon, eh? Hey, but like there are some important elections coming up and some important places around the world. But like, that's not the thing to take away from this. The World Economic Forum, if you're not familiar with them, is the group, is a group of people, the world's, like I've said, global financial elite, our economic overlords, the biggest corporations and government agencies that control the global economy and get to decide what's the most exciting thing that they're all going to be looking at and what are the most pressing issues facing global economics. They get together in Davos and they basically decide the fate of the human race economically. And they are worried that misinformation and disinformation may radically disrupt electoral processes in several economies, not societies, not countries. They don't give a shit about, you know, the democratic process and elections being fair and all that sort of stuff. They just worry that elections, so politics, will affect economics. So if you are the global ruling elite, the f our financial our financial elites that control who gets to have money and what allocation of resources on a global level and like you're used to doing deals with governments that are basically central centrist puppets because like they do deals real really well that's why they're there that's why they're centrist but then you have populist leaders being elected Populist leaders that are only there because they've made promises to the population and they're going to start to do things that might go against the wishes of our global elites. They're going to have a problem with that. They're going to start to think that social media creates unruly populations. Because if you have people dis disseminating their own ideas about things and, you know, starting riots here or claiming, you know, that they should all go on strike over here or they should be claiming certain human rights over here or rights for the environment over there. And this is all being spread on social media. That is a problem for the global establishment. And it's a problem because it's going to affect the several economies and the way that money flows around the world. And so it's much easier for you to tell world governments and to start the conversation about the fact that you cannot trust information these days. Like I said before, we are now in the information age and the way you can control people throughout any society is with information control. In a free and liberal society, you cannot do that because it is a fundamental human right. And so you must convince people that they are being lied to or that these categorical things, which are basically just lies, but we've categorized them as something official now. These things must be sought out and destroyed for your own safety. If you convince people that they will be more safe when governments control the information and governments who are influenced by, like I've said, the global elite, etc., etc., this is how you will be able to control social media and people themselves. This is a tactic in the art of control and we should be very aware of it. And that's why it is scary and very nefarious. It's just the tip of the iceberg, people, and we should be concerned. Now, I'm not going to go any further with that, we'll leave it there. If you have any questions about anything we've covered, let me know if you want me to cover anything else. Leave me a comment. Please like, share, subscribe for more. And like I'm on Patreon now. So if you're interested, please go over there and just join for free. We're trying to establish a community over there. If you can contribute financially, that would be very, very much appreciated. But like I said, just go up and join the community for free. I'll leave a link in the description. Until next time. Please remember, I am, you are, we are a mystery.